Praise the Lord. I welcome you to our Tuesday Leaders Development uh, Meeting tonight in Jesus' name. And I pray the Lord will open our eyes of understanding and make us to see what we need to know about our leadership and about our progress and about all that the Lord wants us to do. The Lord bless you in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for this session. Thank you for your leaders, your workers, your servants. Thank you for the leaders of the church. Thank you, Lord, for the various areas you are making use of everyone, especially at this uh, serious uh, lockdown uh, time that you are using your people to contact all the members and all the people. Evangelism is still going on. Church development is still going on. Church growth is still going on. And we pray, Lord, that you open our eyes to various avenues and areas in our community so that we can do this work acceptably well in your sight in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. Open our eyes of understanding tonight once again, Lord, and help us to behold wondrous things and lessons out of your word in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Tonight, we're coming to the book of the Psalms. And we're coming in particular to Psalm 4. And I'm selecting just verses 3, 4, and 5 for our leadership development tonight. Look at Psalm 4, reading from verse 3. It says, but no that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. In verse 4 it says, Stand in awe, tremble. That's what it means. Stand in amazement and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still, sailor. Then in verse 5, it says, Suffer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Those are the verses we're looking at. And the topic for tonight is the peculiar relationship between God and the godly. God our creator. God our redeemer. God our father. God our Lord. God the most high and any relationship we have as sons of God, daughters of God, as servants of God, and as saints of God, that peculiar relationship is what we are considering tonight, the peculiar relationship between God and the godly. The three things we are looking at as we look at those verses for verse 3, the separation of the godly entirely to the Lord. That's what God demands, and that's what God expects, that we are fully, entirely, and completely, unreservedly separated unto the Lord. The separation of the godly entirely to the Lord. Point number two, the standard for saints entrusted by the Lord. The saints who are commissioned by the Lord. The saints who are entrusted by the Lord. We are entrusted with the gospel and with the work of God, with the service of the Lord, what the standard for such saints, for such sons, for such daughters, for such servants of God, the standard for saints entrusted by the Lord. Point number three, the sacrifices of the righteous expressly for the Lord. Our sacrifices, even though we're serving the church, we're serving men, we're serving our community, we're serving society, we're serving humanity, yet ultimately we understand our sacrifice is unto the Lord, expressly for the Lord. Point number three, the sacrifices of the righteous expressly for the Lord. Let's come back to point number one now. Is the separation of the godly entirely to the Lord. We're reading from Psalm 4 verse 3 again. It says, But know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. 
when it says, but no, obviously you understand, in the beginning of the sentence, it's been saying other things. In verse 2, he had spoken about the people that tried to hinder him and the people that tried to oppress him and the people that wish the worst for him. And it says, enemies, you must know. My opposers, you must know. The people that try to hinder, you must know. It's like David telling, um, telling Absalom, but know that the Lord has set apart David that is godly for himself. It's like David telling uh, the Philistine, but know that God has set apart him that is godly for himself. In fact, we're going to extend it. It's like a Job telling Satan, know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. It's like you telling yourself and telling anybody and understanding that God has set you apart and God has chosen you and because God has chosen you, he has set you apart for himself. And it's like you, a child of God, a saint of God, a son of God, a servant of God. You are telling yourself at every crossroad, anytime, anywhere you are, you are conscious of the fact that you belong to the Lord. Are you born again? You are set apart unto the Lord. Are you sanctified? You are set apart unto the Lord. Are you commissioned for him, by him, to do something? You know, and he sets you apart and he says, this is what your life will be. He has set him that that is godly, him that is righteous, him that has been born again, he has set him apart for himself. And he says, because he set me apart, he's giving me some work to do. He's giving me a sermon to do. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. It's like, uh, let me go back to David again. He comes before Goliath, and Goliath is bragging. Then he tells himself, he says, my heart, don't worry. My heart, don't be anxious. My spirit, don't to be fretting because God has set me apart for himself and he will not allow the Philistine, he will not allow Goliath to kill me, to destroy me you must have that understanding all the time and when you pray God will answer because your prayer, you are praying for the sick that's what he set you apart for you are praying for those who have problems, that's what he set you apart for and because he set you apart for himself and you are walking in the way he set you apart for, and you are doing the work he set you apart for, because of that, when you call, he will answer. As we look at that verse, let's, let's uh, bring it, let's uh, divide it to some three pieces. Number one, the setting apart of the godly. The setting apart of the godly. Look at that psalm again, Psalm 4 verse 3. It says, but no in your heart, but know in your spirit, but know with all confidence that God has set apart him that is godly for himself. He set you apart for himself. Look at Isaiah chapter 43, reading from verse 21. This people have I formed this people have I transformed? This people have I converted? This people have I recreated? This people have I commissioned for myself? He made you for himself. He commissioned you for himself. He created you for himself. And they shall show forth my praise. That's what you are to do. Every time, every day, every moment, you are conscious of the fact I belong to God. He set me apart for himself. He has recreated me for himself. He has appointed me for himself. He has commissioned me for himself. Therefore, I will show forth his praise. It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, reading from verse 19. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, it says, Watch, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. And the New Testament brings it forth very clearly. It says we don't belong to ourselves. We are born again. You are a child of God. You live on earth now. You cannot just decide, this is what I will do. Some people say, I'm not happy living anymore, therefore I'm going to terminate my life. You can't do that. You don't belong to yourself. You can't take that life. 
and you can't take that personality. You can't take who you are and throw it to the winds and throw it to the sea and throw it to the hands of the devil. You do not belong to yourself, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. In verse 20, it says, in verse 20, it says, For ye are bought with a price. You are redeemed with a price. You are purchased with a price. You have been born again. You are cleansed. It says you are bought with a price. Therefore, this is the conclusion. And this is the, uh, the, this is the evidence that you understand. You are bought with a price. Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. That is, which belongs to God. Look at Titus chapter 2, verse 14. And this tells us again what Christ has done. And the result of what Christ has done, he says, who gave himself for us. Talking about Christ, our Savior, our Sanctifier, our Redeemer, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. Why? And purify unto himself. And purify unto himself. And separate unto himself. And cleanse us for himself. And sanctify us for his own purpose. And purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. So we cannot be inactive. We cannot be indolent. We cannot be lukewarm. And we cannot just give up and say, well, I'm just going to live an easygoing life. We must be zealous of good works. Because we are placed on earth and we are here for a purpose. Look at that Psalm 4 verse 3 again. As Psalm 4 verse 3 says, But know that God has set apart, the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. If he has set us apart for himself, it is now for us to respond to that. It is now for us to react to that and that brings us to our surrender unto God. Our surrender unto God. As he called you, as he commissioned you, as he set you apart just for himself, not for Satan, not for the world, not even for yourself, not for your tribe. He set you apart for himself. That's why Paul the Apostle said in Galatians chapter 1, reading from verse 15, he understood I'm set apart for God. He says, but when he pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, not by merit, and called me by his grace. In verse 16, he said, immediately, he says, to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately, I confide not to a flesh and blood. He said, I have come to the realization that the Lord called me, and the Lord recreated me, and the Lord converted me, and the Lord changed me. And he did that so that I can be fully and wholeheartedly and entirely separated and given unto him. He says, because of that, I confer not, I don't discuss with, I don't consult with flesh and blood. It tells us, uh, the word of God tells us in Matthew chapter 4, reading from verse 18. Matthew chapter 4. Reading from verse 18, it says, And Jesus, walking by the sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishers. They were doing their regular thing. They were doing their daily work. And they were just carrying on life. And they thought they were fishermen. And they were going to be fishermen until the end of their lives. Nothing wrong with fishing, but is that the ultimate purpose why God created Peter? Why God created Andrew? Look at verse 19 now. It says in verse 19, And he said unto them, Follow me, you are cut out for something. You are created for something. You are converted for something. And now you are going to discover the reason why you are here on earth because the Lord has set apart him that is godly all for himself. Therefore, he says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. 
I will make you. I will make you. I will recreate you. I will make you to become the person God had in mind before he created you. I will make you fishers of men. And thank God for their response. And thank God for your response too. In uh, verse 20, it tells us in verse 20, it says, look at this, verse 20, and they straightway, that means immediately, they left their nets and they followed him. What, what a great example for us. What a great example for you. And a great example for me. When they were going for fishing that morning, they didn't think they were going to have a different course of life, a different path of life, but the path came and the call came and immediately straightway they left their net and they followed him, not only Peter and Andrew, look at James and John, in verse 21 it says, and going on from thence he saw other two brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother in a ship with Zebedee their father mending their nets and he called them and he called them these were people oblivious to anything that will take place in the future different from what they were doing at that time and he called them and then in verse 22 the beauty of their response and the glory in their response to the lord and they immediately led the sheep and their father and they followed him that's their surrender and that should be our surrender that should be our heart that should be our pattern that should be our style of living he calls us and when we hear the word of god like we're hearing tonight and he says god the lord has set apart him that is godly unto himself, then you realize, you look at your life, how much of your heart, how much of your time, how much of your skill, how much of your ability you are spending for the Lord. I say, but wait a minute, I now realize the Lord has set me apart for himself. That brings us to point number three now in that place, the servitude of the godly, the servitude of the godly. We're reading from Psalm 4 and verse 3. In Psalm 4 verse 3 it says, but no. That means here you are, you're moving along, you're committed to something. All of a sudden the Lord says, uh, look at your life, look at your occupation. And look at your aspiration. And look at your vision. And look at everything you are concentrating on. And now he says, but you must know. But know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. If you are sure you are born again, he has set you apart for himself. If you are sure you are sanctified, he has set you apart for himself. If you are sure you are a pastor, you are a preacher, an evangelist, a servant of God, he set you apart for himself. If you are sure you are a women leader, if you are sure you are a campus leader, if you are sure that it is not just that you are just there, but you are saved, you are sanctified, and the Lord has selected you, you must understand whatever the physical appearance whatever the physical situation whatever the section where you are walking in god set you apart for himself and the lord will hear when you come if that is so that brings us then to the submission the servant church of the godly the servant church of the godly were to serve him were to serve his creation were to serve his creatures were to serve his church were to serve the saved, were even to serve the unbelievers in bringing them to the knowledge of the gospel. That is our servitude. It says in John chapter 12, John chapter 12, reading from verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die. Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. And then the continuous verse 25, it says in verse 25, He that loveth his life shall lose it. That is, he who does not realize, who does not come to the understanding, I am set apart for God. And is living for himself, is thinking for himself, is planning for himself. Everything he wants to do is saying, how does that affect me? 
How does that bring me gain? What do I profit from that? Such a person living for himself will lose his life. He will lose the excitement of living for God. He will lose the joy of serving the Lord. He will lose the reward of serving the Lord. And it says, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. And when it says, he that hateth his life, when you plant your life in the work of God, you plant your life in the service of God. The people of the world who know you, they'll say, with all the intelligence you have, all the skill you have, all the ability you have, you know, you could make a lot of money if you were on this side, if you were on that side. Looks like you don't love yourself. Looks like you hate your life. And looks like you are throwing your life away. They don't understand. But Jesus said, when they say that, don't change because of that. Don't turn around because of that. And don't say, well, I need to be reasonable. You're already reasonable. If you do what the Lord has called you to do, what God created you to do in life, you are reasonable already. If you say, I'm going to be reasonable now, I'm going to lean, on, uh, lean to the world, you are becoming unreasonable. It says, he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. Look at the reward in verse 26. In verse 26, if any man who knows is set apart for God, if any man who is godly and is set apart for serving the Lord, if any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Isn't that a reasonable man? Isn't that uh, the thoughtful man is serving the Lord and the heavenly father will honor him. Remember Psalm 4 verse 3. In Psalm 4 verse 3 it says, But know that God has set apart him that is godly for himself. Look at this. The Lord will hear him when he calls unto God. The Lord will honor him. The Lord will honor you. As you pray, the Lord will honor you. You say, I know that's my servant calling. I will answer. And when you ask for anything, I know that's my servant demanding. He has abandoned himself to my service. He has given himself to my service. I will honor him. And the Lord will hear when you call on him. That's our understanding. And that's the realization that there is a separation of the godly entirely to the Lord. Let's come to Psalm 4 now, verse 4. Psalm 4, we're looking at verse 4. This brings us to point number 2. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. That word sailor at the end uh, means pause, don't rush on, stop. Don't rush on and think and meditate and apply the words you have heard. Look at this. The three things here. Number one is command for all sins. Is command for all sins. Stand in all and sin not. Number two there, the communion in our soul. Commune with your own heart upon your bed. And then number three, the calmness in our spirit. And be still. Look at number one there. It's this command for all saints. Stand in awe and sin not. As we are born again, our lives become different. And the things we used to do, we do them no more. The places we used to go, we go there no more. And the kind of lifestyle we used to follow, we follow that no more. Stand in awe. And appreciate that conversion. Stand in awe and appreciate the calling of God upon your life. It brings you to a new station in life, a new status in life, a new standing in life. Stand in awe and sin not. Here is the word of God to all Christians. Look at First Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, reading from verse 34, awake to righteousness and sin not. You see, that's the commandment of the Lord. Every generation of believers, anywhere we are, once the grace of God has come upon your life, once the truth of God has dawned upon you, 
and that transforming power has touched your life. Awake to righteousness and sin not. Uh, look at um, Romans chapter 6, reading from verse 6. Romans chapter 6, looking at verse 6. He's saying that the Lord himself has done this work in us. Work of recreation. What a work of salvation and work of sanctification. He says, knowing this, we must know that. We must experience it, knowing this experientially, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and that henceforth we should not serve sin. Life has changed. Life has turned around. And because of that, henceforth, we do not serve sin. In fact, it says in verse 12, look at verse 12 of that Romans chapter 6, it says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, because we are not to serve sin anymore, because we are not to live like the old life anymore. We are now master over our lives. We are master over sin. We are master over ourselves. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the laws thereof. Look at verse 22. In verse 22, it tells us, but now be made free from sin. He set us free. He made us free. He converted us. He changed our lives. He gave us salvation. And he says, we are made free from sin. Look at this. We become servants to God. Ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. You know the commandment there, it says, we should not continue in sin. Ours is the grace. Ours is the mercy. Ours is the power. Ours is the enablement of the Lord. He changed us. He transformed us. He turned us around and things are different now. Let's come back to Psalm 4, reading from verse 4. In Psalm 4, verse 4, it says, Stand in awe and see not, commune with your own heart upon your bed. Commune with your own heart upon your bed. You know what is saying already we have learned in the previous psalm, no Bible, no breakfast. We have learned in the previous psalm, we must delight ourselves in the word of God and meditate on the word of God day and night. You remember that? Day and night. We come to the night part now after we have read our Bibles. No scripture, no sleep. No scripture, no sleep. We have read the word of God and we are lying down. Lights are off. But we don't fall asleep immediately. While we are lying there before sleep comes, we are meditating on the word of God. We commune with our own heart upon our bed. The word of God I've heard today. How has that brought fruit in my life? The promises of God, have I claimed those promises? The precepts of the word of God. How obedient am I to the word of God? We're communion. We're communing. We're meditating. We're ruminating. We're turning over the word of God in our hearts. The communion in our soul. Psalm 77 we're looking at verse 6. In Psalm 77, verse 6, I call to remembrance my song in the night. The song of praise, we're called that to remembrance. The songs of joy, we're called to remembrance. The songs and the psalms, we're called to remembrance. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I commune with my own heart. I commune with my own heart. I don't allow my heart to just stray here and stray there. I think, I commune, I meditate with my own heart, and my spirit makes diligent search. In my spirit, I'm searching the Word of God. In my spirit, I'm taking in the Word of God. In my spirit, I'm understanding the Word of God more, and I'm applying the Word of God in my heart. Look at Psalm 63, verse 6. Psalm 63, we're looking at verse 6. It's telling us about this communion, about this meditating in our heart. It says, when I remember thee upon my bed, 
and meditate on thee in the night watches. And meditate on thee in the night watches. You know, if the psalmist were living alive today, if the psalmist were living at the same time, were living today, I'm sure I can tell you this, he will not be concentrating on watching uh, this and watching that on the social media as uh, it's about to go to sleep. It is not the people, entertainment industry, that will put him to sleep. He'll be meditating in the night watches upon the word of God. Think about a man like that. He wakes up in the morning. He takes the word of God. He has his devotion. He reads the word of God. And the word of God maps out for him how he is to live for the rest of the day. And then in the night, after everything is over, before he falls asleep, he's meditating on the Lord, on the glory of the Lord, the power of the Lord, the goodness of the Lord, the faithfulness of the Lord. Even in the night watches, tell me such a person, will live a blessed life. It tells us in Psalm 39, reading from verse 1, Psalm 39, reading from verse 1, But I said, I will take heed to my ways, that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. This is a careful man. This is a watchful man. And that's how the Lord wants us to be careful and to be watchful. That before we open our mouths to speak, we think about what we're going to say. And you know, it is when you have uh, that mouth that is with a bridle, then you sin not with your mouth. It says in verse 2, in verse 2 it says, I was dumb. For silence, I held my peace, even from good, and my sorrows was turned. That is, all my challenges, I can think about that. All the things at the crossroad, I can think about that. You see, there are people who don't think about life. They don't think about their challenges, and they don't even pray about them. They don't think about the problems and the conflicts in their personal lives, in their families. They don't have any time to think about the personal challenges they have. Because of that, there's no prayer. And because of that, there's no change. But the psalmist said, I will be dumb or silence. I will hold my peace, even from good. And then my sorrows touch in me. In verse 3, it says, my heart was hot within me. While I was musing, while I was communing with my heart, while I was meditating, musing, the fire burned. Then speak I with my tongue. Then in verse 4, it says, Lord, make me to know mine end. You know, a person who is just going from day to day, Tuesday is like Monday, Wednesday is like Tuesday, all the days are the same, whatever is happening, rain is falling, sun is shining, the storm is uh, raging, whatever is walking in and out in life, as if uh, nothing is happening. But a man who is given to meditation, a man who is looking at everything happening, you know, and he meditates, he communes with his heart about his personal life, about his family, about his progress, about the work of the Lord, about the evaluation of the work the Lord has given him to do. He meditates, he evaluates everything, then he'll be able to pray, Lord, make me to know my age and the measure of my days, what it is that I may know how frail I am. And look at that, Psalm 4 verse 4 again. In Psalm 4 verse 4, it says in verse 4, Stand in awe and sin not. That's the commandment. And then commune with your own heart upon your bed. That's the communion. And now be still in your soul. Be still in your spirit. That's the calmness in our spirit. Be still. Many things might happen in life that will jolt you. Many things might happen in life that will upset you. 
many things may happen in life that will make the, the bowl of oil or the bowl of water you are carrying to spill off. Many things may happen in life that may make you stumble, but when you are still, when you are calm, when you are not agitated, when you are not worried, when you are not anxious, and you are able to look at the whole situation, evaluate the whole situation, and then see what you ought to be and what you ought to be doing, it tells you that you are not jolted and you are not stumbling and you don't fall. You will not fall in Jesus' name. There must be calmness in our spirit. Look at Psalm 46, verse 10. In Psalm 46, verse 10, be still and know that I am God. Don't just rush into action. Something has happened. All of a sudden, you just rise up and you begin to move here and there, staggering like a madman. Be still. Keep quiet. Be still and be calm in your soul. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. Whatever happens, God will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. He is the Lord. He will be exalted. Don't allow anything to jolt you. Continue to act the way God wants you to act. And if there's a problem you don't understand, what the solution is at present, don't worry about that. But still, the Lord will save. The Lord will deliver. And the Lord will heal. When you have a report that has the tendency of worrying you, of destabilizing you, be still and know that God is God. Look at Isaiah chapter 26. Isaiah chapter 26. We're looking at verse 3. It says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is staged on thee. The Lord will keep you in perfect peace. You rest your mind on God. You stay your mind on God. You have perfect peace. It says because he trusted in thee. That is the man, the godly man, the righteous man, the godly servant, the righteous servant who is trusting in the Lord. The Lord will keep him, will keep her in perfect peace. And then in verse 3, it says in verse 3, trust in the Lord forever. Trust in the Lord forever. That is, uh, whatever happens on the way, how rough the way might be, suddenly something happens that has the tendency of making you to be beside yourself. Trust in the Lord forever. For in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. He'll give you peace, and that peace will abide, and that peace will make you to be calm in your soul, in your spirit, at all times, in Jesus' name. Actually, Jesus said in John chapter 14, John chapter 14, reading from verse 27, it tells us the kind of peace he has given us, and it says, peace I live with you. You see, after he left, he knew that the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he knew that the members of the Sanhedrin will trouble those disciples. They will try to stop them, but he said, I'm leaving here, but I'm leaving with you peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. How do you understand that? My peace, my kind of peace. The same kind of peace I had on the stormy sea, my peace I give unto you. The same kind of calmness and serenity and peaceful mind I, I had when those uh, Pharisees rushed at me, that same peace I give unto you. The same kind of peace I had when even Satan was doing his worst, and I knew that this was a danger of the Lord. I'm supposed to go to the cross, and I will get to the cross, and I will go there confidently, depending upon my Father, my kind of peace, the peace I have enjoyed, and the peace that comes from me, I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Looks like 
we can control that heart. Looks like we can control our feelings in the heart. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. It says, and if we put it in a language we can understand, it says stop it from being troubled. It says, control it from being afraid. We can, because Jesus said we can. After all, he has given us his peace. That peace will abide in your heart, in your life, evermore in Jesus' name. Philippians chapter 4. In Philippians chapter 4, reading from verse 6, it says, be careful for nothing. That doesn't mean don't take care, don't watch. It may, what it means is be anxious for nothing. Be troubled about nothing. Don't fret at anything. Whatever is happening, whatever noise you are hearing from outside the window, it says uh, fret not and don't be anxious. God is thinking about you. He will take care of you. Be careful for nothing but in everything. In everything, something happens suddenly to the child at home. In everything, something happens suddenly to the wife or suddenly to the husband. In everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God, and the Lord will answer your prayer. Look at verse 7. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding. People cannot understand how you are calm in your soul. Are you a calm in your spirit? Are you a calm in that stormy situation? But it's the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. It will keep you calm every time in Jesus' name. If you are a person by nature, Give me to worrying and give me to being anxious and give me to staggering because of the things happening. The Lord's hand will be upon you. He'll give you peace. He'll give you calmness in every area of your life, every area of the family, every area of the ministry. There'll be calmness in your soul, in your spirit, in Jesus' name. That's the standard for the saints who are entrusted by the Lord. He gives us a commandment, sin not. He gives us the communion, we commune with our soul, we meditate, and then he gives us the calmness in our spirit. We come to point number three now, and this is in Psalm 4 verse 5. Psalm 4 verse 5, offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Offer the sacrifices of the righteous, sacrifices of righteousness, sacrifices of the righteous, the same thing, and put your trust in the Lord. You know, if we're going to have uh, our service to be rewarded by the Lord, we need to sacrifice. And there are times it will not be totally convenient. There are times it will not be comfortable for us. There are times in season when everything is easy, everything is going well. Other times it may not be easy. Out of season, but we'll remember you are the righteous one. And because you are the righteous one, you are offering the sacrifices of the righteous expressly for the Lord. When you say sacrifice, it means something that pinches you a little bit. Not convenient for you all the time. What sacrifices are that? You know, we see from the word of God. Look at Psalm 51 verse 17. Psalm 51, reading from verse 17. It says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. When you look at your life, and by the grace of God, you're living straight. You're acting straight. You're righteous by the grace of God. But then you see a tendency of a person like uh, Saul, that all that the Lord told him to do, he didn't do. He didn't, uh, you know, finish all the, all the assignment. And now he came back. Instead of acting like Saul, saying, I've done everything you asked me to do, you think about it. I didn't touch that part. I didn't touch that area. I didn't go that direction. And your heart is broken. You go before the Lord. I'm sorry, Lord. I'll do better next time. I'll do more follow-up next time. I'll be more active next time. The sacrifices of a broken spirit. Not a person that will just have a kind of a plastic face and say, well, I've done the best I can. 
oh lord that's what i can do in fact i'm doing better than other people uh -uh. you have a broken spirit and of course if any sin had occurred if any sin had taken place that sin will break you down and you go back to the lord like david said and then you say the sacrifices of god a broken spirit a broken and a contrite heart oh god thou wilt not despise number one then a broken spirit that's a sacrifice number two is the sacrifice of consecration look at some 50 verse 5 in some 50 verse 5 it tells us uh, gather my saints together unto me those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice that's a sacrifice of consecration you bring your life you bring everything you have you lay on the altar you are making a covenant of the lord by sacrifice things that are precious to you things that are priceless things that others are running after you've got those things already but then you now come to present that before the lord oh lord i lay it as a sacrifice before you that's the sacrifice is talking about the sacrifice of consecration it tells us in psalm 118 verse 27 Psalm 118, verse 27, God is the Lord, which has showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even unto the horns of the altar. Look at verse 28, it tells us, What kind of sacrifice thou art, my God? I will praise thee, thou art my God. I will exalt thee. In verse 29, it says, O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endureth forever is the sacrifice of absolute surrender. I'll praise you, I'll glorify you, I'll honor you, and I will concentrate on you. You will be the very center of my good deeds, of my good works, and I bind that upon the altar, like Abraham sacrificed unto the Lord, and the birds came to take that away, but he will not allow your binding, your sacrifice upon the altar. As we look at 1 Samuel chapter 15, reading from verse 21, here Saul said, but the people took of the spoil, the sheep, oxen and the, the sheep the chief of the things which should have been destroyed to sacrifice unto the lord thy god in gilgal to sacrifice unto the lord thy god in gilgal and now samuel told saul what the real sacrifice the lord is expecting is look at verse 22 what samuel said as the lord has great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the lord that's the sacrifice he wants sacrifice of obedience when obedience is not easy when obedience is persecuted when obedience is contradicted and you're saying we must obey god rather than men that's a sacrifice Be behold to obey is better than sacrifice and to hack in on the part of rams but you know the sacrifice can be very costly. It can be the sacrifice of a costly price. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 24. 2 Samuel chapter 24, reading from verse 24. In verse 24, here is what David the king is saying. And the king said unto Aaron, Nay, but I will surely buy each of thee at a price. I will buy each at a price. I'm not just going to take what belongs to you, what belongs to another person, and sacrifice that to the Lord. I'm not going to transfer my service to the Lord. I'm finding it difficult. I'm finding it hard. It's becoming more costly. And then I push it on around her, and I say, okay, bring all that you have, and then we'll sacrifice that. He said, no, I will surely buy each of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which does cost me nothing, of that which does cost me nothing. I will pay and I will, I will pay for it. I will offer a sacrifice of costly price. Then he said, so David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. Not only that, if we come to Jonah, 
chapter 2, verse 9, Jonah, chapter 2, verse 9, Jonah came to the realization of himself, and he said, but I will sacrifice unto thee. I, Jonah, will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that which I had vowed. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. As a prophet, he had vowed unto the Lord. As a publisher of the message of God, he had vouched unto the Lord. As a proclaimer of the message of the Lord, he had vowed to the Lord, but now he wasn't fulfilling that vow. The Lord said, go to Nineveh, and he ran away from Nineveh. He was going the other direction. You know the story. Now, eventually, in the whale's belly, he began to pray, I will sacrifice unto thee. For the voice of thanksgiving, he was still in the trouble. He was still in the whale's belly, but he said, I will, I will. I will pay that that I have vowed. What have you vowed to the Lord as a preacher? I will earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. I will take the word of salvation to the sinners anywhere they are. I will take the word of upliftment to the people of God anywhere they are. We must now have the sacrifice of the preacher's vow. Now we come to Romans chapter 12. Reading from verse 1. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies, look at this, a living sacrifice. Your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Then in verse 2 it says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There is a sacrifice of our service. Sacrifice of our service. And it says, we present our body as a living sacrifice. Whatever strength remains in that body, present it to the Lord. Whatever skill, whatever ability, and whatever might you may have, whatever authority you may have, whatever skill you may have, present that unto the Lord. That is our reasonable service, the sacrifice of our service. Look at Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15, By him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. Continually. Somebody is asking a question, Is there a time we may not feel like praising God and yet we have to praise God? Yes, yes. Paul and Silas in the dungeon, Paul and Silas with their feet in the stalks, Paul and Silas in the midnight. That's not a time we think we should be praising God. Some people be asking, Oh Lord, why me? Oh Lord, why this? Oh Lord, why should this be happening? But they offered the sacrifice of praise unto God. And the Lord is saying the same thing. You know, in whatever situation we find ourselves, by Him, by the Lord Jesus Christ, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is the fruit of our leaves, giving thanks to his name. A lot of things to thank God for, whatever may be happening. Ephesians tells us in chapter 5, verse 2. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2. And walk in love as Christ also as love does. Look at this. And he has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God as Christ has done. And he has given himself as an offering and is a sacrifice to God in the same way we walk in love because that sacrifice is a sweet smelling savor unto God. It's a sacrifice of love. You know, love many times will demand sacrifice. Uh, you think, uh, you know, the selfish man, the self-centered man would like to live for himself. He likes to eat all his food, then he can be full. He likes to wear all his clothes, then he can uh, look presentable. He likes to spend everything he has upon himself. 
but then he understands my neighbor. He understands my brother. He understands my sister. He understands that uh, family. He knows that he must stretch out the hand of love to them. And sometimes he has to deny himself. You know, sometimes when we give, people see that man has a lot. Not really. That's not what we're given. We may not have a lot, but we give in love as our sacrifice. It's a sacrifice of love. Look at Philippians chapter 4. Reading from verse 15. Philippians chapter 4, verse 15. Uh, now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving uh, and receiving, uh, but she only, in verse 16, uh, it says in verse 16, uh, for even in Thessalonica, he sent once and again, once and again, once and again. Even in Thessalonica, he's talking to the Philippians and he's saying, although I was far away from you and you couldn't see me and you couldn't touch me physically, you couldn't come to me physically, but you were thinking about me. That's love. That's love. The sacrifice of love. And because of that, they gave their gifts. And you sent once and again, Unto my necessity. In verse 17, he now says, Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Verse 18 then says, But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you. The things which were sent from you, look at this, an odor of a sweet smell and a sacrifice, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing unto God. When we think about other people, we think about uh, ministers of God, we think about those who are devoting their lives, their energy, everything they have uh, to the service of God. They could have been doing another thing. They could have been in business or in trade, but they said, no, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to serve the church of the living God. We don't just uh, forget them and say, well, the church should take care of them. Yes, the church should be taking care, but we remember them and we sing to them, we pray for them, and we do things that will be sacrifice of our gifts unto the Lord, but through them. Then we have the sacrifice of good deeds, hospitality. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 13, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 16, but to do good and to communicate, forget not, do good unto other people, do good unto the saints, do good to the children of God, don't ever forget, with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. It's a sacrifice. With such sacrifices, God is well pleased. And now in First Peter chapter 2, verse 5, First Peter chapter 2, verse 5, ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. We offer, we are a holy priesthood, and we are offering spiritual sacrifices unto God by Jesus Christ, and that is very much acceptable. You see, when it says we should offer the sacrifices of righteousness unto the Lord, number one, sacrifice of broken spirit. Number two, sacrifice of consecration. Number three, sacrifice of absolute surrender. Number four is sacrifice of obedience. Number five is sacrifice of costly price. Number six is sacrifice of the preacher's vow. Number seven, sacrifice of service. Number eight, sacrifice of praise. Number nine, sacrifice of love. Number ten, sacrifice of gift. We give to Paul. We give to the pastor. We give to the preachers. We give to the full-time workers. We give to the people who are giving their lives as a service unto the Lord. Number ten, sacrifice of gifts. Number eleven, sacrifice of good deeds, hospitality. Number twelve, sacrifice of ministry. As we look at all these sacrifices and then we say, I am going to offer. You know, as we list all these sacrifices, you cannot say, I don't know what to offer.
offer. I don't know what, whether I have something to offer. Of course, as you look at this, you have a lot to offer. We'll come back in conclusion to Psalm 4, and I'm reading from verse 3. Psalm 4, we're reading now from verse 3. It says, but no, brother, you must know, sister, you must know this, that God has set apart him that is godly. That's you. He has set you apart for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. Look at verse 4. It tells us in verse 4, it says, standing on and sin not, commune with your own heart upon your own bed and be still. Don't be jolted, don't be agitated. Be still, the Lord will take care of you. And then in verse 5, it says, offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. The Lord will take care of you. All that we have learned today, we have learned about the peculiar relationship between God and the godly. The peculiar relationship between you and the almighty God, your separation unto God, the standard for the saints, for the servants of God, and the sacrifices of the righteous expressly for the Lord. The Lord has taught us a lot. Let him now apply all that in our hearts. Why don't we rise up and say, Lord, I thank you for the revelation. I thank you for the understanding. I know I'm set apart. You are set apart. Thank God. He will not allow the devil to make use of your life. He will not allow an evil past to make use of your life. He will protect you. He will guard you. He will preserve you because he says he's jealously guarding your life. He has reserved you unto himself. The Lord has set you apart for himself. Tell the Lord, tell the Lord, and say, Lord, I thank you for this understanding because of that. Absolutely now, honestly now, completely now, I surrender myself unto you. And I will serve the servanthood of the godly. I will serve. I will serve you, my God. I will serve your children. I will serve your church. I will serve the people of God. I, I will not pick and choose. I don't like that one. I don't have any choice. That one I say I don't like. Is he not a child of God? Is he not a member of the body of Christ? I cannot say I don't like that one. I not relate to that one. I'll not commune with that one. I serve everyone. And when anything happens, I don't understand. I will give myself unto the Lord and I will I will obey the commandment of the Lord. There will be no sin. There will be no evil in my heart, in my life. Every day I will walk the way he wants me to walk. I will become in my soul. I will become in my spirit. And then uh, joyfully and happily I will offer the sacrifice of the broken spirit. I will offer the sacrifice of consecration unto the Lord. And I will not withhold the consecration I laid on the altar in the past. The past consecration is still intact. And in new consecration, I bring sacrifice of absolute surrender, sacrifice of obedience unto the Lord. Grant me more grace, Lord. I will obey you. It may be costly. I will sacrifice the sacrifice of costly price and the preacher's vow. In the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, when it's convenient, when it's not convenient, the preacher's vow to declare the word of God without fear and without favor, earnestly contending for the faith was delivered unto the saints. Lord, I will. I will render my service. Unto the, unto the kingdom of God. I will render my service to the people of God. I'll offer the sacrifice of praise. When everybody might be crying, when everybody might be complaining, I will praise the Lord like Paul and Silas. I'll offer the sacrifice of love. I love the Lord. I'll offer the sacrifice of gifts unto the Lord, but I'll be hospitable. I will give, and then I will offer the sacrifice of spiritual ministry. The Lord accept your sacrifice in Jesus' name. And the Lord reward you. And the purpose for which he has set you apart, the Lord fulfill it in your life every day until you breathe your last, until the Lord comes to take us away from earth to heaven. You will not look back. You will not slow down. You will not be lukewarm. You will keep on sacrificing. And the Lord will keep on blessing your life and rewarding your life in Jesus' name. Let's pray to the Lord together. Father, we thank you for the revelation of your word today. 
Thank you for bringing us this understanding, reminding us once again that everyone that is godly, a godly child, a godly son, a godly daughter, a godly sage, a godly servant of God, you have set every one of us, each of us, apart for yourself and unto yourself, and we will do your will all the days of our lives in Jesus' name. And we're asking, Lord, that ability to fully, totally, entirely surrender ourselves, surrender everything we have, we will, you will grant unto us in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, we'll act like servant, not as lords over God's heritage, not as uh, leaders and rulers uh, with dominion over the people of God, we will manifest the servitude of the godly in our lives and our service that we render unto you and to the body of Christ and to the world will be acceptable unto you in Jesus' name. We're asking, Lord, the commandment you have given us that since we now have the grace of God, we're the new creation and we're good creatures, new creatures in Christ and we should not do like we're doing before. We should not live a selfish life. We should not live a selfless life. We should not live a sinful life. But you have told us to wake up and uh, wake up unto righteousness and sin not. We pray, Lord, that grace to abide in holiness and righteousness. You grant to every one of us in Jesus' name. And then the habit of meditating, communion with our own heart. Communing and meditating and musing on the word of God. Not just allowing our hearts to run here and there and to run away from us. That ability and that uh, habit of communing you give unto us in Jesus' name. Lord, we know that uh, many of us by nature were easily jolted, were easily uh, kind of uh, moved from here to there and it's like when something happens uh, suddenly it jolts us but Lord, you can give us calmness in our spirit, calmness in our soul and you can keep us in perfect peace. We pray, Lord, the peace that Christ has given us will control our hearts, control our thoughts, control our action. In Jesus' name, we're asking, Lord, as we have called us to offer unto you the sacrifice of a broken heart and the sacrifice of consecration and the sacrifice of absolute surrender and the sacrifice of obedience, we're asking, Lord, all that sacrifice will bring to the altar again. And we're not sacrificing animals like the children of Israel did, but now we can bring our obedience unto you. We can bring a, a sacrifice of costly price unto you. We can bring a sacrifice of love. We can bring a sacrifice of, of the preacher's vow. And we can say, Lord, we have laid our hands on the plow. We're not going to look back. The consistency we ought to have in doing your work and preaching your word and the totality of abandonment to your will and to your work, grant unto every one of us in Jesus' name. And Lord, we pray that when it comes to love, we'll sacrifice. And when it comes to a body, we'll sacrifice. When it comes to ministry, we'll sacrifice. When it comes to the gifts that we ought to give and the good deeds we ought to do and the hospitality, Lord, we pray you will help us to remember anytime we're trying, we're getting tired, anytime we're getting weary, anytime we're thinking, uh, what's the use and what's it? Uh, I've done this, I've done that, I'm even getting tired now. Lord, we pray that spirit spirit of lukewarmness. You will drive away from every one of us in Jesus' name passionately and zealously and purposefully, absolutely will surrender everything we have unto you to your service in Jesus' name. And we pray the spiritual ministry that we ought to carry on every time and day and night, morning and afternoon and evening, grant us the life to be sold to the service of the Lord that that spiritual ministry as your priest, as your, as your spiritual priesthood, will continue to offer and your blessing will continue upon our lives. We have the assurance already that when we call you will answer. I pray for every brother, every sister, every servant of God, every child of God that as we call upon you, you will answer our prayers in Jesus' name. 
prayers for ourselves, prayers for members of our family, prayers for the people we are concerned about. Lord, grant every one of your children definite answer to all our prayers. We thank you because we know you have answered and we know the joy of the Lord and the peace of God will be the strength of every one of us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen.